Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia, and I'm also currently a Danish Diabetes and Endocrine Academy visiting professor at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. The idea behind Inside Exercise is to bring to you the absolute who's who of exercise research, so exercise physiology, exercise metabolism, and exercise and health. And what I'm really wanting is for you to get your information about exercise from the absolute research experts rather than from influencers. And indeed, today I bring to you Professor Luc van Loon from Maastricht University in the Netherlands. He is a huge name in exercise metabolism. He's published over 475 uh, journal articles, had large amount of impact, especially in the area of exercise metabolism, and especially protein metabolism, the effect of protein on exercise adaptations and the effect of exercise on protein turnover, et cetera. We talked a lot about protein, how much protein do you need in your diet? How much if you're an endurance athlete, a strength athlete, uh, how about with aging? And as you'll see, he says that most people, especially those who are exercising, should get enough protein in their diet for their protein needs. He's done a lot of studies, not only in healthy young people, but also with aging. And also you'll hear very interesting studies where he's even done electrical stimulation in people in ICU and found that they maintain their muscle mass. I found it really interesting. I think you will too. So stick around. If you look down the notes, you'll see there are timestamps. So ideally you'd watch the whole podcast to get the full context. But if you wanted to jump around a little bit, you'll see on YouTube, you'll see the time in blue. If you click on that, it will move to that section that's indicated. And on the other podcast platforms, you can see the time and you just move manually to that position. Also, if you can do me a favor and help get the message out about Inside Exercise, if you like, subscribe, leave comments, etc., the algorithm will tend to suggest Inside Exercise when people do searches. Okay, so enjoy the chat. Hi, Luke. How are you? Welcome to Inside Exercise. Thanks for coming on. Good. Hi, Glenn. Glad, yeah. glad you're having me. Man, I'm think, I was trying to think, when did I first... So you came down, I think, to Deakin University, and you were learning how to do Westerns and things. Um, during your PhD, when would that have been? That was like ages I ago. I was actually my, my first postdoc. So uh, my oh, first postdoc, I went to Deakin, and uh, Mark Hargraves was there, and a lot of uh, people that I fortunately now can call friends. And yes. uh, yeah, we started working. I mean, basically, Deakin was one of the first to do a lot of molecular biology in, in exercise science, and I wanted to know what the hype was about. And that was one of the reasons why I went to Melbourne. Cool. All right. So did you start off, a lot of people that I've had on the podcast were sort of sports people into exercise and then they they went, oh, I could actually work and exercise. I could be a researcher or be a researcher first and then moved into exercise. How did you, how did you get started? What was your background? I think I've always been interested in, in science and research, but I think like at least one of the, many of the other researchers in this field that I know, they're basically failed athletes or people that don't have the genes <laughs> to become a good athlete. And then they, they're they trying to figure out uh, what they can do besides having bad genes. And I'm certainly one with the bad genes, I think. I also find there's quite a few modest people on here. So what 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 was your background? What were you doing? And, and were, you, were you as bad as you make out? No, I was, I mean, I was doing just, just some some sports like like some cycling, of course, being in, being in Holland. And some some resistance training and weightlifting, but it was obvious that I was never going to becoming a, a professional athlete or anything like that. I certainly don't have the genes mm -hmm. for that. So, how did you? What what made you decide to get into exercise research? How did that come about? I don't know. I mean, I was always reading like uh, superhero comics and stuff like that, so I was always interested in adaptation of muscle, whether it's a radioactive spider or exercise. I mean, uh, all of that stuff was was really interesting, and I mean. Uh, you also had, uh, I think it was was Dr. Connor, somebody that grew his his own arm when he had had his head, had his arm amputated, and so okay. uh, all of that kind of stuff was always uh, a lot of my imagination as a kid. So I'd like to understand how the body works, how the body functions, and how how we can change it. So did you get it? Did you do it like an undergraduate in exercise science or, or straight? So no, I you... first wanted to do uh, medicine, but then it was difficult getting into medicine because it was basically a lottery. And, and so I turned, uh, turned up doing health sciences with uh, the uh, the major in movement sciences. And so that was my university training. Did physical therapy in the evening hours and in, in addition. 
Um, and then basically it started really when I, uh, I, I did my internship at uh, University of Texas in Austin. And after that, I basically did my, uh, my PhD here at Maastricht University, then went to Deakin, Melbourne. And after that, I basically followed my career here at Maastricht University from uh, yeah, postdoc to uh, assistant professor, associate professor and professor. And was Anton Wagenmakers your supervisor? Yeah, he was my, together with uh, with Wim Saras, they were my supervisors. Right. And All right, so, uh, again... so, so, so funny enough, I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot of people from, 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 from them actually that, that stayed in science because it was Olaf Royakers first as one of their PhD students. And he's now at Karolinska uh, working a lot of the intensive care unit patients and, and the muscle metabolism there. And then I think it was uh, Gerrit van Hal who is now running the MassPAC labs uh, in Copenhagen. And then it was Oscar mm -hmm. Jukendrup, who uh, everybody knows mm -hmm. uh, now runs his own My Sports Science uh, company. And um, and then it was me afterwards. So uh, all downhill from there. <laughs> now, Oscar, I've managed to, to get a hold of Oscar, and it sounds like he might come on at one stage. We were still trying to sort it out, so that'd be good. All right, so we're going to talk about um, – we're going to, I shouldn't say, we're going to – we're going to talk about uh, protein and muscle adaptations to loading and unloading. Um, so, why don't you give us a bit of a bit of an overview of of you know how you've ended up in that sort of area, and and then we'll sort of talk about you know protein and adaptations to training and things like that. So, most of the work that I did as a PhD student was substrate selection, and that was mo mostly just the the interaction between carbohydrate and fat use, of course, and especially uh, during exercise. And then throughout my postdoc, I slowly moved towards protein metabolism because I saw the adaptability, the plasticity of skeletal muscle tissue. And that basically caught my interest because I already done a lot of work on carbohydrate and fat metabolism, and you want to keep it novel and new. And, and so I started looking into uh, protein metabolism. And yeah, what is amazing is basically how the muscle is able to adapt, and it's always intrigued me. And of course, the two main factors that allow us allow our muscle to adapt is nutrition and physical activity. And I think when I mean uh, my supervisor already started here the stable isotope lab, and so when I started using uh, or measuring muscle turnover, it became obvious that we constantly break down and build up muscle. And so mm -hmm. this constant turnover of muscle gives you the ability to adapt. And so uh, understanding the role of physical activity and, and, and nutrition in this adaptability of muscle has, has caught my interest in everybody in our lab. So that's that's mainly the work that we're doing now. Yes, yeah, so I thought we might just talk a little bit about some of the, the methods without getting too complicated. So I know there's a classic, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, but Rominge paper 1993 where he he looked at the you know 25%, 65%, 85% of VO2 max and what you're using. So as you said, you're looking at carbohydrate and fat metabolism, how much glycogen, how much glucose, et cetera. But in that paper, they had to assume um, the fat use. They, did, they didn't know the breakdown of the fat use. So why don't you just tell us about, because that's a big big paper that was has been really highly cited, how you followed on and you included the rest in that. And it just sort of explains the sort of methods you're using a little bit. Yeah, I think that is that is a study that that probably came in. I mean, th this is probably the first or the second study that I ever did as a PhD student, and it's now part of a lot of textbooks uh, on substrate use during various intensities of exercise. What we did there is simply, uh, I mean, it's it's actually quite simple. It just needs infrastructure and and of course all the mass spec uh, facilities. But what you simply Money. do is you, you use indirect kilometry, and you measure just with indirect kilometry you measure oxygen uptake and carbon dioxide production that gives you total energy expenditure and total fat and total carbohydrate oxidation. If you combine that with tracers, for example, a glucose tracer to measure plasma glucose uptake and release uptake and oxidation, which if you subtract that from total carbohydrate oxidation, you end up with glycogen, uh, endogenous glycogen oxidation, at least coming from the muscle, because of course, what comes out the liver is also uh, going through the circulation. And then you use plasma uh, fatty acid tracers infusion with uh, labeled palmitate to measure plasma fatty acid oxidation. You subtract that from total fatty acid oxidation and you have a measure of intramuscular fatty acid oxidation. And so then you have the four different endogenous fuel sources, um, carbohydrate, 
the, the differentiated between plasma glucose oxidation um, coming from either the liver and or the gut, if you're actually ingesting glucose during uh, exercise. And of course, what comes out of the liver separately and also plasma free, free fatty acids coming from your adipose tissue and fatty acids coming from your endogenous muscle stores. And so then you have a basically a four fold or even a five fold if you also use exogenous glucose coming from your glucose drinks, for example. And you can see the differentiation between those different fuel stores during exercise. Yes. So you found it was nice because you were able to have the rest, you had the rest and the the the, the three exercise intensities. Yeah. And is it fair to say about 60, 65% of VO2 max is where so we're talking about the carbohydrate. I'm just wanting to introduce the the fact of traces and then you then went on to use those with protein metabolism, yeah. So it's fair to say probably 60, 65% VO2 max is where you tend to sort of start using more carbohydrate and less fat. So it's the fact that you can actually look at these intensities using the traces, yeah? Yes, but you always have to take care that you think about what kind of subjects are actually included in these studies because mm -hmm. uh, these studies were all done, of course, with endurance trained uh, people. And uh, their uh, time or exercise intensity dependent change in substrate use is different from, for example, untrained people or even uh, more clinically compromised patients. So always think about that the 65% is not generic for everybody. It depends also on what kind of subject or what kind of population we're talking about. Okay. Well, that's a good little intro because I think I would I would like to actually talk about protein needs and things uh, first and then talk about the adaptations. But as you say, they go hand in hand. So seeing as you're talking about, you know, you have to think about your the, the type of participant you've got, it's probably good to think about that. So if, can we think about what are the protein needs of a person that's that's sedentary, for example, versus an athlete, and, and whether it's endurance trained and uh, strength trained? Can we start thinking about that and, and how you've sort of determined that? Yeah, I mean, that is, that is I mean, I, can, I think you're starting with the most uh, the most difficult question it's what are our needs and then of course what are needs i mean the world health organization says we require 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day in order to uh, sustain everything um and yes that's true but i think you can sustain life also with a lower amount of protein um but it's less optimal of course but i mean uh, i think the body can adapt to a lesser i mean you see people in 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 starvation or people that are from uh, from from less uh, privileged countries uh, probably consume a lot less and they still maintain a certain level of muscle mass and they and in fact they don't disappear to say to say it like that i mean it is the body adapts to a, to a lower protein intake and of course we also know that you can gain more muscle when you ingest more protein or you supplement it in a, in a smart way so uh, the point 8 is certainly not the be all and end all and you probably need more to optimize adaptability and adaptation to, to exercise training. And of course, uh, when I started going to college, they were still talking about a 0.8. And now if you read the guidelines on athletes, they, 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 they vary between 1.2 and 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day. And to be honest, I mean, nobody knows for sure how much is needed and what is optimal. But the funny thing is, is I don't think that discussion is so relevant because if you are an active athlete and you're eating healthy and 10 to 15 energy percent comes from protein, your protein intake is typically very high. I mean, even in normal, healthy, older people and even younger people, it's between 1.1 and 1.3 grams of protein per kilogram body mass per day. So if you're actually putting a lot of hours on the bike or running or whatever, you typically already consume a lot more than that. So I think most athletes already consume enough protein through their normal well, diet. Yeah, this is the thing. So I, I think you probably know I had Stu Phillips on as, as well, and he was essentially saying the same sort of thing that most people just, you know, just eating normal food, um, I guess healthy. You know, you, obviously, you could just eat crap. Uh, then you should be getting enough protein and you don't need to be that worried and, and same with supplements and things. So we, we can go into that. But he, he actually said he, 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 he gets a, bit, a little bit of uh, flack from people saying, well, hang on a minute, you used to say, you know, you need protein and you need to, you know, extra protein, you need to supplement, you need to take it straight after your exercise belt and things like that. But he doesn't believe that now. Are you, are you sort of the, of the same sort of opinion that, and do you, do, and do you get hassled as well? Because there seems to be this almost no, I mean, obsession with protein. 
So yeah, I mean, of course, it's it's popular and uh, everybody eats and everybody is physically active. So everybody is an expert uh, and everybody wants to uh, show their opinion and stuff like that. But that's something different from science. I mean, one of the things that we're doing now is looking at foods. Now, uh, generally, we got a lot of comments like when we start working at foods, there's a lot of factors that you can't standardize in the lab. So most of the stuff in the labs have been done with with protein, uh, protein, so protein powders, isolates, concentrates, or carbohydrate powders, or whatever. So we generally do a lot of research with the individual ground substances and not actually mm. food stuff, because there's so many factors in there, like processing and combination, fibers, whatever. So um, I think a lot of people just read literature and think that we're promoting protein powders or something like that. We don't. We just look at mm -hmm. what protein does. And in order to do that, we give protein and only protein because otherwise we don't know whether it's other compounds actually responsible mm -hmm. for the effect that we see in the lab. So um, I think if I, if, if, if me or Stu Phillips or whoever, but I mean, everybody has their own opinion, of course, if you uh, suggest that ingesting protein after exercise promotes the, adaptive, the adaptation or the increase in protein synthesis gets higher during, during recovery from exercise, and that protein might be a good uh, option to optimize that recovery, then we're not suggesting to eat this or that. We're just show it that it's protein doing the job. Whether you uh, ingest that protein as a protein drink or an energy bar of a protein bar, or whether it's a real meal, doesn't really necessarily make a difference. It's interesting to know what those differences, but I would say to every athlete, consume some protein after an exercise bout. But that doesn't mean it's a protein powder or a milkshake. It could be a meat, well placed meal. So if somebody does exercise in the evening, ensure that you have a protein rich snack after your your session. That could be uh, for from a logistical point of view uh, an, a protein bar. But I would actually prefer to actually place your dinner there, for example, or have dessert mm -hmm. after the training while you have your dinner at five. We're generally not advising uh, the use of, of, of supplements. And I don't know many people, serious people in our job that suggest that we need supplements because, I mean, look at the name by itself. I mean, I'm not native English, but supplement means on top of. So a yes. supplement is because your normal nutrition doesn't provide enough nutrients. And of course, then there's something in most, most cases that means is there's something wrong with your, your basic nutrition. I think you can get all nutrients from your basic nutrition. Sometimes it's easier to get it from a, mm -hmm. a supplement. And that is just being lazy in, in, in a lot of cases. I mean, think of an athlete, uh, a cyclist on a bike. He could also have a plate of pasta on the bike. But cycling without your hands on the steering wheel and actually eating a, a, a plate of pasta mm -hmm. is more difficult. So that's why we invented sports drinks. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just a, an, an easy, practical way to get the nutrients you want. But especially on an everyday status. I mean, we prefer having good food, a good balanced diet. I mean, and that provides you with all the nutrients. Exactly. It's like I often think about vitamin C tablets and things like, you know, why not just eat an orange, you know, because you're getting all the other things. Just, just out of interest, when you are actually looking at food, do you actually find, because I wouldn't be surprised you'd actually find maybe you know, better effects having the, if you had the same protein in an isolate versus same amount in food because you know there's all there must be all sorts of other things that are going on interactions between foods and absorption yeah, and i mean that's, that's of course when you that's the problem if you start with foods uh you don't know what the interaction is i mean um, um because in foods there's first of all all the compounds that we know and in foods there's probably also or there's certainly a lot of compounds that we haven't even defined mm. yet or haven't mm -hmm. even measured yet I mean, uh, many years ago, were we talking about, um, I don't know, keratins or uh, whatever, whatever. I mean, there's so many compounds that we're now uh, detecting that might actually play a role. I mean, think of that, all the, the beetroot juice and the uh, green leafy vegetables that we now know that the nitrate has an effect, but there's probably an interaction with other compounds in food that actually increase the efficacy on, for example, lowering blood pressure. And it's not only the nitrate, but there's other factors that can boost that effect. Mm -hmm. Can I go back to what you, I was interested that uh, I know the classic is 0.8 grams per kilogram protein that, as you said, the World Health Organization. I was actually interested, you said you could probably get away, uh, well, you know, maybe not training, 
but just in everyday life with less than that. Because um, I've actually tried to get Benta Keynes here. I've tried to get her on the podcast, but she's she's um, not that keen right now. I'm still still working on her. She's actually doing studies looking at lower protein intakes than um, than the normal. So so I always say she calls it low protein, but it's not actually low protein. It's just lower than what people normally have. So you're saying people normally have I don't know one point one to one point four or something. You said so she's doing more say point eight or point nine. And she's actually finding in that situation that sometimes athletes are doing better because they're they're actually able to have more carbohydrate, which is, you know, instead of having this extra protein, is which is actually taking the place of something else. She's showing in some situations, I don't think she's published all this yet, but for for example, endurance exercise, they may actually do better with the 0.8 or 0.9 because then they're having actually more carbohydrate. Do you have any Thoughts on that, uh, I guess. It, yeah. yeah, plus the fact that, that if you have changes in body composition, that also can have an effect on performance, of course. And uh, you all have to express it based on total energy intake. Is it under the total energy requirements, above the total energy requirements? But uh, funny enough, there's a lot of things that we really don't know. I mean, there's been studies that we collaborated in with Magritte Westerterp, who actually showed that with a very low protein intake, uh, she didn't see any changes in body composition uh, over, and that was several months uh, we followed up with a study on, I think it was only two weeks of a low protein intake diet, which was not even low, as 0.75, if I remember correctly, versus okay. 1.5. Now, what was interesting is that the uh, lower protein intake, so 0.75 versus 1.5, resulted in um, reduced splenic sequestration. Now, this is a diff- difficult word. If researchers start using difficult words, it generally means that yes. they don't talking about and they're trying to hide it so splenic sequestration is the amount of protein or amino acids that are taken up from the gut but not released in the circulation so we think it's actually just being used for for example reconditioning of your intestinal tissues and your liver so it doesn't it is not released in the circulation but it is taken up from the gut now this amount of splenic sequestration or um is actually reduced on the low protein intake diet in other words, mm-hmm. more of the ingested protein is, is released in the circulation released. on a low-protein mm-hmm. diet. So can you imagine how this, is, how this works? So imagine your gut takes up quite a lot of the protein after a single meal to retain its own integrity. And then part of it, or the greater part, is actually released mm-hmm. in the circulation, which then can go to the muscle or to other organs. Now, if you're, mm-hmm. put, if you're putting yourself on a lower-protein intake diet, it seems that the gut gets less greedy. Can mm-hmm. you imagine? How is this, how is the this, how is this regulating? So somewhere mm-hmm. down, downwards from the gut, the muscle and, and some organs are saying like, hey, gut, be less greedy because we're not getting enough amino acids here. And then the gut gets less greedy and slows its turnover or the liver. We don't know. So there seems to be an organ crosstalk in order to mm-hmm. regulate that every tissue gets the amino acids they need. I think that's amazing. And so and there all- is adapt- adaptability to an increase and a, and a decrease in protein intake. It's like it might almost be prioritizing the, the muscle or, or something out of this, the splenic bed. Uh, to that- be honest, I don't think it prioritizes the muscle. Because, uh, mm-hmm. in, in, in order to sustain life, I think the organs are more... Brain. More to, yes, mm-hmm. possibly. I mean, I mean, this, this is maybe too much for uh, for a lot of the audience listening to this, but... Um, if you've seen le- lectures by me, I always start with people having to look at their own arm and understanding that turnover of muscle is is one to two percent per day, which means that in two to three months, you have completely remodeled your arm or your leg or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that muscle has this immense turnover that you can you can you can use. But uh, we have already started looking at all different t- tissues and their turnover, like uh, connective tissue uh-huh. like tendons organs cartilage bone uh, mm-hmm. heart lungs everything but also the human brain mm-hmm. now if i can tell you that the human brain has a turnover that is about three times threefold higher than muscle mm-hmm. um, and actually this was published years ago in in i think the journal brain i never heard of it but it was interesting for the the, the neurosurgeons that we worked with so the human brain has a turnover three times higher than muscle so it shows that the brain has a lot of plasticity 
But if you just assume that all the proteins in the brain have the same turnover, which is, of course, not the case, but on average, this high turnover suggests that you have a new brain in about three weeks. So <laughs> how does that work? Mm -hmm. So you probably don't have many amino acids in your brain um, now than the same ones that you had when you were 10 years old, if there's any. Mm -hmm. But you still think you're you. How does that work? So mm -hmm. there's also a constant refurbishment in your brain. And of course, we know this from MRI studies that people that, for example, the taxi drivers in London that have to memorize all the different roads, they actually see changes in the brain or first year med students where, where, where they actually shown this. And also with tissue taken out of the brain, and we did that with severe epilepsy patients that got brain surgery, we actually saw that this turnover in the brain is really happening at a very high rate. So we infused tracer, so it labeled amino acids prior to surgery. And then during surgery, the, 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 the skull was opened up and this part of the brain was taken out. Not for our study, it was taken out anyway. But then we actually just took part of that tissue that was taken out and measured the incorporation rate. And that was really high. So three times higher than, than, than skeletal muscle. So oh, it shows okay. that all our tissues have an enormous turnover. And um, yeah, maybe this is disappointing for the muscle physiologist and also for myself. For many years, I said that muscle is the most important organ for protein metabolism because it contributes more by, by way of its total mass to, 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 to whole body energy, uh, whole body protein metabolism. But it's not the case. Because your organs have a much higher protein turnover than your muscle. So one kilo of liver probably contributes as much as 30 kilograms of, uh, of muscle. That's true. That's interesting. Wow. Okay. And we used to think, like you said, bone, you've touched on bone. We used to think bone was just like chalk. You know, you'd, you'd literally break a bit of chalk. <laughs> now we know there's like, even during exercise, there's changes in in yep. flow and, and, and uh, glucose uptake in bone and there's a whole lot of stuff going on. I'm sure that's turning over, maybe a bit slower. All right. So can we just that's, talk? Doesn't make, that's, just... That doesn't make that much of a difference, actually. It's in the same ballpark as muscle. Uh, oh, wow. So it's okay. cartilage, bone. So it's bone protein. It's not necessarily calcium, but it's the, the bone proteins um, actually have yes. a similar similar uh, turnover rate. Yeah, that's the thing people don't necessarily think about. You've got this 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 protein backbone that which the, the calcium and things is laid da down on. So when you're getting osteoporosis and things, it's not just the change in the the actual calcium and things like that. It's the actual architecture of the, the protein and things like Especially that. Especially the architecture, you have your cortical bone, bone and your trabecular bone, and you have to differentiate between those. Two. So the, we're also doing this now with people that get a hip fracture. We infuse tracers and then look at the turnover of the bone protein in those different uh, bone fractions. Oh, could have done that with me. I managed to break my neck of femur in a bike crash. <laughs> In 2012, that was not fun. So, uh, so okay. could, have, could have called calls. We would have flown over, but then surgery would have had to be, have to be postponed. <laughs> All right. Now, I want to just pin you down a little bit more with the protein stuff, just make sure we're, we're clear on the, on the intake. So you were saying you, you can get away maybe with lower than 0.8 even, uh, and you know, you'll know get different amounts that are retained in the gut and whatever. But but in terms of exercise, so you know, you were saying they used to think 0.8, now we say one point. Well, what was that paper that said 1.2 to 1.7? And they were saying it was 1.2 uh, for the uh, strength train, I think, and 1.7 for the endurance, which felt back to front. And, but that was more when they first started out, and then it sort of went back to about 1.2. What was that classic paper? And then, and then how are we now, it's sort of, I don't know, around that same sort of ballpark. Is that optimal for um, endurance and and resistance trained athletes? Or do, because do, some people still talk about, you know, two grams per. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anybody can say what is optimal because in that case, you know, you'll have to have the same people in a crossover design, uh, basically living uh, with a certain training program for, for a year and then compare three different different uh, dosages. I mean, that, that, that is a study that's never going to happen, of course. Um, but what is important is to basically look at what people are saying. And they're based, I mean, sometimes they're based on nitrogen uh, balance studies, which is uh, in some cases very questionable uh, how it's done and what, what it means, but also on training studies to see whether people can actually gain muscle on uh, on a lower or higher protein intake diet. Now we've shown that, for example, that uh, pre frail elderly uh, were only increasing muscle mass when they got additional protein. Uh, whereas the group additional that to what? Additional to, 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 so, to, 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 to habitual, habitual diet. 
and that only the ones that didn't get additional protein, they didn't uh, increase their muscle mass, but they did gain muscle strength. So it was the, the exercise is always beneficial. Now, there's also people that have shown training studies with people on a low protein diet, 0.8 grams, and they can, can actually still increase muscle mass. But is it maximally, is it optimal? No, probably not. Hmm. You probably get an optimal, if you look at a meat analysis uh, that Naomi Cermak did years ago, is you basically see that all of those studies suggest that additional protein helps you gain more uh, muscle during training. Now, I think the, the, the reality lies in the fact that if you challenge the body, whether it's because you're sedentary or clinically compromised on the lower end or on the higher end when you're, you're increasing your training load, then additional protein will help you gain more muscle. In between, if you're ingesting a lot of protein already, it's not going to be much of a benefit. And you will have to have a huge study in order to show the benefit. Because if you already ingest ample protein, a, a bit more is not going to change a lot. Also think about the supplementation. If your daily protein intake is 80 grams, why do you think that 10 grams on top of that is going to change a whole lot? It's only a fraction of the total. So all of that you have to see in the light of perspective. Now, some people talk about endurance athletes not eating or not requiring a lot of protein. But this is just homework for everybody listening. If you have a Tour de France rider that has 25 megajoules of energy per day, and he's consuming most of it through carbohydrate drinks and stuff like that. So total protein intake is maybe only 10% of that energy intake. You calculate mm -hmm. for yourself how much protein they are just a ingesting. Lot. They're ingesting a yeah. huge amount of protein, even though they are only like 60 or 65 kilograms. So, mm -hmm. so it's the same thing with all these guidelines. We say this is needed, but if you're very active and you have a high energy expenditure, you typically also eat a lot. And with exactly. eating a lot, you generally also get higher protein intake. So even the, the, the small endurance athletes consume quite a lot of protein, well more than what they probably need. All right. So, so we're able to say then that that on on average, people do not need to take any because you did say earlier that you know it's not a bad idea to take a protein, take something after exercise, whatever. So it made it sound like you should actually be thinking about what when you're eating your protein. But if people are on average ninety nine percent or more of of athletes That's sound like good, they're getting enough protein, why do they need to even it. worry about? No, mm -hmm. but you're making the same, not the same mistake as what I said before. And now you're saying eating the protein, but that protein could be just part of your normal meal. Food. So if I, exactly. So that is part of the normal food that is not on top of food. It's your food. So yes. what I'm saying is after an exercise session, it would be smart to optimize the reconditioning process by ingesting some food after your training session, which you generally do anyway, because you eat at least three times a day. Okay. All right. Yeah, I guess I guess I'll, I'll just try and explain what I was getting at there. So when I was talking to Stu Phillips, he was saying how they, they, there used to be this thought about you know this 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 protein window, yeah, this anabolic window, the first couple of hours after exercise. But now you know he said it's been shown twenty four to forty eight hours, and they're calling it the anaerobic, the anabolic um, anabolic garage door, you know, because it's so wide open. So what I'm I guess I'm thinking there is, as long as you're getting enough protein, what does it actually matter? when you take it, because if, if the, the exercise increases your protein sensitivity, I, I, basically. I think this is, this is an interesting, so you exercise makes your muscle more susceptible or sensitive to the anabolic properties of food intake. So your mm -hmm. increase in muscle protein synthesis is greater if you ingest the same food after exercise than if you don't do the exercise. Now that is measured up to even 24 to sometimes even 48 hours of exercise, you have a greater response. So if you have exercise tonight or this afternoon and you have breakfast tomorrow morning, your response to the breakfast tomorrow morning will be greater mm. if you have performed the exercise. So a lot of people ask me like, so why is it important to ingest protein immediately after exercise if you mm. can still get the benefit later on? Now, this is a big question because I always tell them like, don't get freaked out if you don't ingest the protein immediately after exercise because for the next 24 hours, every, every main meal mm. will get a greater response. However, yeah. uh, we did a study, and that was when Ben Wall, Wall was still in our lab, is he actually looked at the anabolic response to breakfast the next morning if you had or had not ingested protein prior to sleep after the exercise session. 
because mm-hmm. I thought that that win- anabolic window might re- be reduced when you actually have a lot of protein in the beginning so that you have a longer window when you ingest less at the beginning. I thought that might be actually explain mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. So like I assume it's, exactly. Mm-hmm. So if we give a lot of protein prior to sleep, I expected the response to breakfast to be less. Yep. Now yep. we saw that despite the amount of protein, I think we gave quite a lot, like 60 grams before the sleep, after the training session did not seem to have an effect on the breakfast response the next morning. Okay. So that suggests that there is actually a sweet spot where more protein leads to a greater response. And I didn't expect to see that. So the, the response to breakfast the next morning was the same, independent whether you, whether you did or did not ingest protein prior to sleep. But of course, the protein prior to sleep increases protein synthesis while you sleep. We've shown that in other studies. Um, so you basically, over those 12 hours or 16 hours, you had higher muscle protein synthesis. Is there a negative feedback loop 18 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours? I don't know. That is impossible to figure that out in these studies. But it does suggest that the first few hours, also like glycogen, you actually can accelerate the adaptability of the muscle when you provide enough substrate. That's the same with glycogen. If you give a lot of of carbohydrates immediately Mm -hmm. after exercise, you get a greater uptake because of glucose, glucose transporters still being on the outer out of sight of the muscle and you expedite glycogen synthase. So it seems that somewhere in the beginning, that's a smart, smart idea to actually get some protein. Okay. Just let me clarify that, I guess. So make sure we are on the same page. So the, the exercise increases the anabolic sensitivity. Basically, you're more likely to take up protein than if you hadn't exercised. And you're saying that, that the next morning that is still elevated and it's actually not affected by whether you have a lot of protein. Um, after the exercise or not but you're saying rather than that being like oh well, it doesn't matter because it's, you've still got the same sensitivity you're saying that you might as well have had that 10 hours or whatever where you were taking up more protein because that you're going to have more uh anabolic um you know more protein uptake while while you were asleep correct yeah so so i don't know whether uh, there is a negative feedback loop on the lunch or the evening dinner after that. So yes. whether that, I don't know, but I mean, at least for those first yes. 14 or 16 hours, it seems to be additional benefit to have uh-huh. the protein prior to sleep and the next, next, that, next. That's exactly, I'm glad we brought up the glycogen as well, because that's exactly what I was thinking. Cause I know that, that there used to be the whole, remember there was the same thing about, oh, you've got to eat your carbohydrate, you know, in the zero to two hours versus two hours to four hours, like Ivy, John Ivy sort of studies. And yes. saying, well, you do have higher glycogen synthesis in the first two hours versus if you wait. But the point is, though, I think if you look at 24 hours, you kind of end up at the same point because it just so takes the, longer the, the to get to that studies by point. Louise Burke showing that after 24 hours, it doesn't make a difference anymore. That's possibly also the case for protein metabolism. We don't know. But in interesting for protein metabolism, it's not about optimizing glycogen availability uh, for the next exercise bout. For no. protein metabolism, it's actually optimizing the response to every training session. So if you're if you're training every day, you want to have the, the, the training adaptability to optimize before the next training session and the next yep. training session and the next training session. From that perspective, protein metabolism is different from the glycogen because that's only storage. And with protein metabolism, it's not having a great availability of amino acids, but actual incorporation it's in functional proteins that we require to become a better athlete. Now, let me ask you the classic thing, um, because we tend to, and I'm glad you mentioned earlier, like when you said about the effects of different protein, you were talking about on the muscle uh, size and strength, not necessarily just, you know, uh, protein synthesis rates. So you're looking at the the end point, you know, the prize, the end point. Uh, yeah. Just then we, we talked about looking at the protein synthesis rates. So is, I wonder if you can just sort of talk about that a little bit, how you can't always just assume that's measuring like protein synthesis for three hours or even, you know, 24 hours is, is necessarily so, going to affect your muscle mass in 20, in 12 weeks or whatever. So I'm, I'm really happy with all the guys interested in uh, muscle mass gain who want to be involved in research in protein metabolism. And most of these guys are interested in weightlifting, resistance training and gaining muscle mass and stuff like that. But it also, um, they should also be more susceptible that adaptability is not necessarily gaining more muscle. And so I think the literature is sometimes a little bit uh, overclouded 
with that exercise is in, in these cases often referred to as resistance exercise. But of course, adaptability is what we're measuring. We are me measuring the synthesis of muscle following a bout of exercise. Now, if you do different types of exercise, different sets of proteins are being to express to a greater extent. For example, if you do a lot of resistance exercise, you make myofibular proteins, you become bigger muscle with more uh, capacity to generate force. Whereas, for example, with endurance training, you increase the change in the quality of the muscle to oxidize more fat, to uptake more, to take up more, more, more oxygen, um, higher mitochondrial protein uh, content, uh, better perfusion, capillary density, etc. That is all adaptability. But of course, one leads to more muscle. The other one does not necessarily lead to more muscle. Look at the differences, the phenotypic differences between a, a marathon runner and a bodybuilder. They look completely different, but both of them have very high protein muscle protein synthesis rates after an exercise session. So mm -hmm. if you look at resistance exercise, yes, there is a correlation between the increase in muscle protein synthesis after an exercise bout and the overall increase over time in muscle mass. You can find those, those correlations. They're not always great because, of course, that changes over time. And the acute response to a single bout is not transferable to every bout over the next three years, for example. But it definitely does not have to have any correlation if you look, for example, to an athlete that doesn't want to gain, gain, gain muscle. So mm -hmm. increased muscle protein synthesis is not synonymous with gaining muscle mass. Yep. It's a measure of conditioning. You also have protein breakdown on the other side. I mean, it's like if you rebuild your house and you want to put a new bathroom in there, you have to throw the old bathtub out before you put the new one in. So it's reconditioning. It's not simply adding on. Exactly. It reminds me of how um, I remember it was the European Championships, like, I don't know, 30 years ago. And the, the 10,000 meter runner who won that race got busted for taking anabolic steroids. And people were like, he must be crazy. Like, why would he be taking anabolic steroids? He's like, look how skinny he is. <laughs> so why don't you explain? Well, we don't want to condone that, but just the fact that he's turning over his protein, right? And he needs protein synthesis, better recovery. You know, I'm not condoning steroids. I'm just saying that it's... To increase training intensity, for example, because you have faster recovery, et cetera, yeah? Yeah, and he's turning over. So endurance trained athletes and strength trained athletes and all sprinters and things as well. They're all going to have an increase in their protein synthesis with the exercise. But as you say, there will be differences in protein breakdown, et cetera, and the end result will be very different. So the endurance person is going to be increasing their mitochondrial enzymes, and but also just turning over the muscle, right, as you yep. said. And, and and what are we I, – I think I got confused a bit before with the 1.2 to 1.7 and whatever. Is it essentially the same for strength train and endurance train people, the, the protein needs, or is there a bit of a difference? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the jury. I think the jury is still out on those. Uh, we have different studies with uh, amino acid oxidation, of course, uh, uh, strategies. We we have nitrogen balance and stuff like that. It seems that with higher turnover, you also your protein requirements, your protein use are higher. Of course, when you're an endurance athlete, you also oxidize amino acids as a substrate. And if you're spending a lot of hours on the bike, you might be oxidizing quite a lot of protein in the total. But that is by far compensated by the fact that if you are an endurance athlete, you actually also consume a lot of food. And always part of your food is actually protein. And so they typically ingest relatively more protein, certainly per kilogram of, uh, of, of fat-free mass than uh, most, uh, most other athletes. Yes, I'm actually quite pleased. <laughs> if people have watched my podcast and seen with Stu Phillips or other things, I'm not a big fan of supplements. I'm always saying just have a healthy diet and whatever. And I don't want to be pushing. The whole point is I'm, I'm wanting to get the, you know, I don't want to be an influencer. I want to get the information from the experts rather than from influencers. That's what I want people to get. But it seems it just this one I just sort of kind of go on about because you just hear, I go to the gym here in Copenhagen. All I hear is that people are talking in Danish and then I hear protein, protein, protein. <laughs> You know, and I, that word, and you know, and then, and then, as I'm riding the bike, they've got all these vending machines, and it's just like these protein drinks and things. So, can we just is is it able just to get? Well, we'll do takeaway messages at the end, but is it possible? Because I, I know that, as you said earlier, people jump on this. They see, oh, you've looked at the effect of protein isolate on whatever. Oh, I'm, I need to have some protein isolate. And even I'm just looking here in my notes. You know, your paper from 2012, protein supplementation augments the added to, added 
adaptive response of skeletal muscle to resistance type exercise training and met analysis. So anyone's going to look at that, these bros from the gym, protein supplementation increases adaptation. Sweet. I don't need to read any of that. I just need to supplement my protein. So what yeah, would you so say to a bro at the gym here who's, who's got that article and comes up and says, look, you said protein supplementation. We have these discussions all the time. And of course, with uh, everything on the whole new culture on, uh, uh, how do you say that, uh, transparency and stuff like that, and public access or open access of, of scientific papers, um, then everybody starts reading the papers and they interpret everything differently than the researchers themselves. For example, um, how do you, without a background in science, how can you actually, when you have two papers saying two different things, how can you define which is the good paper, which is the high quality paper, which is the lesser quality paper? That's only possible if you're in research mm -hmm. and you actually know the techniques, you know the people, you know the data, whatever. So the other thing is, how do we use definitions? Protein supplementation, and also in that many meat analysis, there's actually studies that use protein, uh, protein powders. There's people that use protein-rich products. There's actually people that actually put up a diet with more protein-rich products uh, contributing to the total diet. So supplementation doesn't, need, doesn't mean using a supplement. It used increasing the protein in your diet. And you can do that through supplements. You can do it by protein-rich products. And you can do it by just increasing the amount of food. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways of doing that. So if we say protein supplementation, we did the study with powders. Because some people, I mean, if you give a, I don't know, a banana or you give a, a meat sandwich or you give some yogurt, you're actually giving more than simply protein. And for the research, you like to see what the protein does. So you give additional exactly. protein mm -hmm. uh, as, mm -hmm. as, as, as nice and, and, and standardized as possible. So that's generally a, a protein isolate or protein concentrate. That doesn't mean you have to translate the research to taking protein powders. I mean, you translate mm -hmm. it into foods. Very nice example that we had. So... Um, for example, a lot of elderly in the hospital lose muscle while they're admitted to the hospital. So um, often they get their evening dinner at around five or six in the evening, and then they don't eat anything until the next morning, say eight or nine when they get breakfast. Mm -hmm. When you're at a high risk of muscle loss, that 15 uh, hours of uh, fasting mm -hmm. is actually detrimental to your muscle. So it, it should be good to actually have some protein in between. But at that point, yeah. we didn't know whether your gut actually functions at night. So what we did is we asked some of our elder, elderly volunteers to come by. And basically, this is the following study. So this is a long story, but in the end, you'll understand why I'm actually telling this. Mm -hmm. So those older guys came over. We would take a muscle biopsy. Then we put the nasogastric tube down the nose into the gut. Mm -hmm. We used intrinsically labeled milk. So milk that has labeled amino acids integrated. And then yeah. we would actually just infuse that during their sleep at two o'clock at night while they were sleeping in the hospital. And so we would take blood samples with retractable lines so they could actually sleep. But we took blood samples, we uh, ingested or uh, administered uh, intrinsic label protein. And in the next morning, I would actually wake them up with a muscle biopsy. You can't imagine why they volunteered for this, but all of these guys actually were very happy to volunteer. And it's actually- Can I clarify, these, these are not- these are not the the people in the rest homes or whatever. These are young, young yeah. healthies. Yeah. No, no, no. These are all the all the people, but still healthy. Okay. And okay. Really yep. Awesome troopers. I mean, these these guys are. I mean, I also always used to work with athletes, but these guys are much more fun to work with because when you say like, "Hey, this muscle biopsy might might sting a little bit," you said like, "That didn't sting." I had a triple bypass. I had my left kidney taken exactly. out. That was painful. I had my left to the hip. So yeah. it's really fun to work with these guys. Yeah. It's like women that have that have had babies before. You do like, exactly. all, you know, women type two, they say, oh, compared to a baby, that's nothing. And mm -hmm. also uh, have a nice story about that because a lot of people don't include women in their studies because they suggest that they're not as keen to have muscle biopsies. Now no. the women generally uh, whine less than the men. So I agree. I agree. But uh, to go back to these, 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 so this study showed that the gut, even when you sleep, still functions. The protein that we administer in the gut is digested and absorbed and in st stimulates muscle protein synthesis during the overnight phase while, while you mm -hmm. sleep. So this is a strategy that could help people to preserve muscle mass while they're in the hospital because they're under fat. So when we published this study, I actually got calls from a lot of coaches asking us, 
where they can get those nasogastric tubes. Uh, oh, can you imagine really? that? Yes. No, I can't. And so I had to explain them. I said, like, there's nothing to do. Beware. This is a proof of principle study to show that the gut stimulus is, it works when you sleep. But to apply this in, in practice, mm. you simply give a protein rich snack somewhere in the evening before you go to sleep. <laughs> you don't need to have lovely. used nasogastric tubes. Mm -hmm. So that is the problem with you, you see science, you see it being, being, uh, being published, but then the translation to practice is a different story. So if a scientist like me or Stu say protein supplementation further augments muscle mass and function, that is not necessarily a certain product. It's not necessarily a certain powder. It's not necessarily a protein isolate. Food. Yeah, it's just above Food. what you'd normally have. Okay, yeah. that's a great example. I like that. Now, just just to, I'm kind of going on a bit. I'm just, I'm still trying to get it clear in my head. So if 99% of people um, that exercise get enough protein, because they're, they're eating more food, you know, without supplementing. Sorry, you know, you know what I mean? Just by eating more food naturally, mm -hmm. they're getting enough protein. Are you still saying that that them, when you give, so when you use the term supplement, you mean above their normal intake. My feeling was, you know, from our discussion so far, is it wouldn't have any more beneficial effects because they're getting enough in their normal so, diet. And, and that's, that's exactly what I refer to, like protein supplementation. So if you increase or actually distribute the protein throughout your diet better, you can actually further increase muscle mass and strength gains. And it's most evident when people actually increase their workload, so increased uh, exercise intensity and or duration, or, for example, on the other side, when we have severely deconditioned people that need to regain muscle so the more and have a low protein intake. So the more compromised the body is, from uh, mm -hmm. uh, exercise intensity or food intake, the more they will benefit from additional protein, which is not rocket science, of course. If you don't eat enough, more will help. If you actually yeah. stress the body and you increase the protein requirements, more will also help. In between, the effects are very small, if not very small. Measurable. All right. Okay, good. And of course, now, if what you about consume enough protein and it's well distributed and it's high quality, you're, and you're not exercising, you're not stressing your body to a great extent, it's not going to do anything because if I'm going to lie on bed and eat protein every day, I'm certainly not going to get a better athlete. I'm not going to gain muscle while I'm lying in bed all day. So it's yes. the interaction between the two. Good it's point. not a yeah, so, so Eating protein is never going to put, if someone wants to look good going down the beach, eating a lot of protein will not make them look good. If anything, I'll put, I'll put on more fat. If it's higher than their I, energy I really needs. love the the uh, the. I mean, Jack Land. That's that's probably somebody that only the people from the U.S. know. But when I actually uh, saw him and I saw his old fifties uh, or sixties videos on TV, it was really amazing. And one of his quotes was, "If exercise is king and nutrition is queen, together you have a kingdom." And I think that go. that is one of the very strong quotes that I think like, hey, people should listen to that stuff. Well, is it fair to say as well? So when I see these people at the gym, so I'm I'm often frustrated. I think I've mentioned it already on the podcast. Well, I'd be wanting to use a particular machine, and there'd be someone that's sitting there on their phone. Sometimes it's like three. You know the the pick uh, the the pick flies. There'll be three machines, and there'll just be three people on there sitting on their on the on their phones. And I'm like, I want to use the machine to actually do exercise. So is it is it worth pointing out to people? I'm sure that you're going to you know say this that the best way to get strength gains is to actually work hard in the gym and the protein is a very thin slice on top that you need to worry about because you're probably getting enough in your diet already. I uh, fully agree, but I mean, I can, I mean, we have a, a very well-known disc jockey in the, in the, in the Netherlands. And at some point he calls out, calls people in seven o'clock in the morning and asks them for, so from their responses. And they called me and said like, uh, Professor Valone, so nobody uses that that term here in Holland, but that time they did, said, what do I need to eat to lose weight? And my only response was less. Less. Mm -hmm. And so, but the question itself, I mean, what do I need to eat in order to lose weight? That's that's a similar, similar to what you're saying. I mean, um, the basic of muscle adaptation is to exercise. The nutrition mm -hmm. can help you optimize that process. But there's no process to optimize if you don't do the exercise. Mm -hmm. So the and, nutrition and is only to optimize the process, to provide you with precursors 
in order to allow the adaptability to be uh, uh, realized. Yeah, and the average person in the gym would get bigger and stronger by actually working out harder. I'm just saying the average. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot that are doing masses of amounts. but Yeah, and most people, I mean, just don't tell people like uh, no pain, no gain. I mean, yes, that it makes sense to some extent, but it's all about consistency. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's exactly. not about that one training session. It's, it's basically uh, sticking to a program and maintaining it because everybody knows, I mean, and, and, and probably you and as, as me as well. I mean, we go to a gym with a certain target in mind. We notice in the first few weeks or the first few, uh, few, few couple of weeks, we already notice that we get stronger, which is mm -hmm. basically our muscular adaptation. We don't see anything happening in the, in the, in the mirror. And then we stop going to the gym and we still pay for six months until we actually get fed up and then resign. So the point mm -hmm. is the body first adapts in strength, in functionality. And then when the body realizes that you are going to continuously ask for more power, strength and functional uh, capacity, then the muscle at some point will, will adapt because it's a very energy costing and expensive adapt adaptation. So the body's not going to do it if it's only for one week or two weeks. Uh, yeah. This is a bit yeah. of a popular scientific explanation, but basically it requires a consistent uh, increase mm -hmm. in, 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 in capacity of the body to actually reach its capacity before the body starts adapting the muscle. And that's what you need to do. So consistency in training is much more important. Yes, and it's, and it's also the old use it or lose it, because if you stop, if you stop going to the gym, then why would you, why would you con continue to hold on to all this energy dense yes. muscle break it down and, and if you as you said earlier you adapt to the exercise you're doing so if you're doing a whole bunch of resistance training and then you decide you want to run a marathon you will very quickly the body will go okay we don't need that muscle anymore and we need to to do things elsewhere yeah all right now just more with protein so when you said good quality protein so naturally we start thinking about plant versus animal proteins um what what do we say there? Is it is it still roughly the same um, amount of protein people need, or is it like well, if you're having mainly, you know, if you're vegetarian, I actually heard in the Tour de France, there's a guy in Australia on SBS, one of the TV channels, he interviews um, a chef every stage of the Tour de France, and the chef actually went and spoke to uh, one of the teams and said, what are the challenges for you as the chef for the team? What are the challenges for you? With these guys and he said well they've obviously got different needs and different amounts of food they have but also two out of the eight um cyclists on that tour de france professional team were actually vegan so so obviously you can do that at that level by being vegan but but what what do we need what do we need to think about there is are people able to get enough protein and the same sort of amounts of grams per kilogram when it's plant versus animal I think that's uh, that's a really good question, and it's also um, the basis of that documentary that you might have seen, uh, the game changers. Uh, a lot of people uh, saw that. Uh, of course, the um, yeah, sometimes it's really like like a little bit flaky from the from the science perspective, uh, or at least the perspective is not always correct. Uh, um, from the perspective of stimulating muscle protein synthesis, most of the research uh, suggests that plant based proteins do not have the same capacity to stimulate muscle protein synthesis to the same extent. And that is because the plant-based proteins have less essential amino acids. They're typically low in leucine, which is one of the amino acids that has a strong anabolic pro uh, signaling properties. And it's often also, also deficient in one or more uh, uh, single amino acids, such as methionine and lysine. So um, there's not a lot of studies being done. I mean, we've been pretty active in the last 10 years because a lot of questions about sustainability and plant-based proteins and stuff like that. But what we do see, to, to actually put it in a nutshell, is that you can compensate for lesser quality by greater quantity. So if mm -hmm. you give more, for example, gluten, you can still get an anabolic response that is similar to dairy protein. But then you compensate for the lesser leucine by simply giving more of the protein. Um, now, of course, and that's, that also alludes to what we discussed previously, if you are an athlete like the people in the, uh, the Game Changers documentary, what documentary, I'm not even sure, uh, Hollywood movie, um, mm. is these guys have a huge energy expenditure. They also have a huge protein intake or huge food intake and therefore also a huge protein intake. So they already compensate 
for lesser lesser quality by greater quantity because the greater quantity is already far beyond what they need. So they don't have to worry about that. So if you have a very healthy diet and you consume a lot of food because you're active, then quality is not a major issue unless you have a very bad uh, single single food food item based diet, of course. But if you have a well balanced diet with all these different proteins mixing together, with all having their uh, individual deficiencies, and you compensate uh, a little for the lower quality and the lower digestibility by simply ingesting a lot of food, like for example endurance athletes, low weight, high energy expenditure, high food intake, there's not an issue. But if you start uh, telling older people that can hardly eat any food to suddenly start eating vegan, and there the, the certain minimal amount of protein that they can ingest is of lesser quality, I'm not sure whether that's a good thing. Mm, that's a good point. Quality um, becomes uh, more important when the capacity to eat is reduced. Yep. And also, I guess um, they, you know, if they think about. So, my wife's a dietitian, a dietitian, and a, and a vegetarian. So, tries to always make sure we have, you know, some sort of legumes, you know, beans um, in with the meal. Yes, and also when you say a vegetarian, I mean vegetarian. Um, um, it's always with a little bit of definition for everybody, but I think most vegetarians still eat dairy and eggs. Yes. Eggs, I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure whether that's still, but depends on. Uh, but but with that, then you have highest quality proteins as a vegetarian. So I'm not worried there. Uh, then yeah. it's only just substituting the meat for high quality uh, dairy proteins, for example. Uh, um, vegan is, 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 a, is a little bit more difficult, of course, if you don't eat fish, dairy, and meat and, and, uh, and eggs. And then you have to know what you're doing, basically. But that's that's that goes for everybody, of course. Just the other thing I was wondering is, is um, you know, vegetarian uh, foods, as you say, often lack one or more essential amino acids, but people aren't normally eating just one thing. They're not just eating beans or potatoes. They're having a mixture. So they, they're going to be getting all the essential amino acids in that meal more yeah, than yeah. So, so you mentioned vegetarian, but I mean, if it's dairy, then then you're not missing out on anything because they're just as high quality as uh, yes, as sorry, meat. Uh, vegetable. But, actually, but, but for for <laughs> vegetables, yes, they, they tend to be low. But uh, first of all, um, don't um, there's a lot of different plant based proteins. We actually did a paper where we looked at all the available uh, plant derived protein isolates and concentrates available in the market, and we actually saw some of them were actually very high in total essential amino acids and not much less than, than animal-derived proteins. Some actually had higher leucine content than most uh, animal-derived proteins. For example, corn is very high in leucine. And then okay. the proteins that are low in lysine often are not low in methionine. So you already mm. find back what your mom always said. Uh, don't eat one single food, but eat different foods and combine these foods. Exactly. Because when you mix them in a meal, those defici deficiencies will bas basically be compensated by the different food groups that you're that you're consuming. Exactly, and I think that's another thing that just gets gets I don't know lost. I just you know people say, well, uh, vegetables don't have all the essential amino acids, so you have to eat meat. Well, you're not just eating you know broccoli. <laughs> you know you're mixing it. And the other thing I always think about is you know we talked about turnover of proteins, right? So. Because you're breaking down proteins in your body and it's going into the blood and the food that you eat goes into the blood, the bottom line is you're going to have what you need in the blood anyway, aren't you? Yeah, so that's that's why I always, so, so people always have the discussion as well, is does every amino acid need to be in every meal or is there still enough available uh, waiting for the next meal to come? We don't know. Uh, that That is an important question that, that future research needs to address. But the other point is very valid what you're saying. So uh, people don't realize that we're very good in recycling. You actually recycle yourself so many times. We could we actually produce uh, an estimated about 300 grams of protein on a daily basis, which could be hormones, which is tissue turnover, which is the microbiome, uh, everything. It's like we, we produce about 300 grams of protein. But you ingest about what it, 70, kilogra 70 grams of protein. That means mm. you're actually recycling 230 grams of protein on a daily basis. So what is phenylalanine in this pinky finger might be actually phenylalanine in my right toe tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. That is really amazing. And, and the amino acids in here might actually turn up in my brain in two days from now. So, 
So you're constantly recycling. Imagine you're making 300 grams of protein on a daily basis, fully assembling, but you only mm. ingest 70 grams of new amino acids coming from outside. That means 230 are reused to make something else in your body. Yes. That's so amazing. Exactly. It's amazing. And it also makes it clear that you don't have to worry quite as much again exactly what's in the meal you're eating. Yep. Because you're saying these are fully assembled proteins floating around the blood, all ready to go again. Now, naturally, there are, because people will be saying, well, but you're losing protein. So so I guess, I don't know the numbers. If you're saying there's 300 going around, there's kind of 70 you're taking in a day, for example, and there's probably 70 that's getting broken down and, and ending up as Yes, urea exactly, and... because if you're in balance, you basically also lose the 70. So of the 300 that you make, 230, of, of the, 230 grams of protein are reassembled from amino acids released from the breakdown of those 300 grams of protein that are breaking down on a daily basis. Right. All right. I've got a question. So we've talked a lot about protein, but I'm thinking more about some of these adaptations to training. And I've got a question on Twitter from Mark. What mechanisms in muscle adaptation to exercise differ the most between individuals? And do these even matter when training load is sufficiently large? Oh, um, yeah, that's a difficult question because that could actually uh, lead to a discussion on so many different topics. Um, I think the most important is not the individual variation, but the uh, the exercise stimulus that is being used. Uh, as I said before, the different types of exercise have different uh, sets of proteins that are being expressed to a great extent, lead to different adaptations. And what for somebody else uh, would be uh, resistance training, or for the other one, uh, other person performing exercise would be endurance training. Now, of course, there's individual uh, uh, variances in the responsiveness to different training because we know that some people gain more muscle or some people tend to be uh, better athletes or better endurance athletes. Uh, we also have a lot of these discussions, of course, of people that were professional athletes or semi-professional athletes, and then 20 years later, they pick it up again and they seem to make a faster progression. Now, I'm not sure to what extent that is just perception, whether it's neuromuscular uh, memory uh, or whether it's actually like memory in the muscle fibers. I mean, that is all discussion that Tim Snyder's in our group is, for example, looking at like satellite cells and muscle memory hypothesis and all of that stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, just that is so so far still in the, in, in debate. And, and and what explains it's probably a mix of everything. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but those are all interesting topics where we can make several podcasts on. Could be genetics, epigenetics, all sorts of things nowadays. Exactly. Yeah, nature um, nurture. Okay. Same chap, uh, Mark, also said, please elaborate. Oh, sorry, before we go into that, I want to ask you uh, about this individual variation. Are you a believer in, um, so I had Claude Bouchard on and talking about you now how you've got genes that determine your initial VO2 max and things, and then genes that determine your increase in VO2 max with training, and then these responders and non-responders. Are you, are you a, a, do you think there are really non-responders or do you think sometimes that they just need more training? Because I, I feel like if you train anyone, they're going to respond. So just the basic sort of physiology. In the... So we, we so at some point there was popular media saying that there's a lot of non-responders to lifestyle intervention in the older population. And of course, that was, uh, that was a happy news for a lot of people saying like, oh, I'm a non-responder, so I don't have to do anything on health intervention. And so what uh, uh, Tyler, uh, Tyler Church, what Van uh, Vene did in our lab when he was here, actually looked at um, the adaptability of people and whether there were uh, non-responders. Because, of course, there's a great variety of ability to how people respond to more prolonged exercise training. We could not find any non-responder. There were people mm -hmm. that seemed to respond more or less but if we took yeah. all the different factors, whether it's strength, leg extension, leg press, or muscle mass, or whatever, there was not a single person that didn't respond to one or more of these different factors. Mm -hmm. So the title also became, there are no non-responders to exercise. But there are people that don't respond to the advice of exercise. But that's something <laughs> completely different. So anybody that works the muscle will have an adaptive, adaptive response. Depends on the workload the basic uh, status of the muscle before you start putting the workload on, but there's not a single person that doesn't respond. There's only people that don't respond to the advice to exercise. <laughs> and is it, is it maybe possible that I'm trying to put together the, the you know, the, the, the previous findings. 
because it may be possible that some people don't respond much to endurance training, but they'll respond to strength and the other ones might go the other way. Or do you find that they respond to everything? I mean, they respond to, they seem to respond to everything, but I mean, there is variation. But then the big question is, is this variation uh, simply within your uh, variation in your measurement methods? Because you don't do a study with an NS1. You generally apply a study with 10, 20, 40, 400 people, and then you look at the average change in, 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 in groups. So if you tease out one subject, does that mean that that person didn't increase muscle or was it just a single measurement that had a lot of, a lot of variation? So that is question one. I don't think you can actually tease out one subject and say this one responded or this one didn't respond mm -hmm. because that's N of, N, N of NS1 research. That is interesting if you're following up as a coach, but that's not science. Um, but, I wouldn't, but I would, I would uh, uh, appreciate that some people respond more to endurance type exercise because from a genetic or an epigenetic perspective, they're actually more prone to respond to that than other yeah. people. I mean, and I've seen those differences, of course. Uh, part of it is what people like doing, but also part is genetics, of course. And but that depends mm. on what I said before. Is it uh, fiber typing? Uh, is it uh, something inherent in the muscle? Is it neuromuscular skills? Is it is it just body built? Is it nature, nurture? I mean, all of these questions come together and it's very difficult to tease them out. And these are things that, of course, it's more easy to, or more easy. Uh, you can actually manage this much more in animal research, for example. That's true. They've all got the same genetics and things. All right. So Mark, again, please elaborate on training volume cycling, i.e. gradually accumulating training volume weeks or months, weeks to months, and then decreasing volume unloading for for weeks. Also to resensitize muscle adaptations. Do you? Or is, is I this think, I think he probably says resensitize. I think so. So overall in most of the training strategies we we often li like to wake up the muscle or surprise the muscle to do something else over after after basically uh reaching a certain threshold or a certain certain maintenance level and then you want to yeah, scare or, or stimulate the muscle again with a different training stimulus for example and of course that is being used used by most athletes um, nobody's actually just uh, really uh, assessed the uh, the signs behind it and how often that should should happen, and 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 uh, what the threshold is, and all of these things that are way too difficult, and likely much more individual, and therefore difficult to to study. Yeah, I, w I wonder if because you know you're often looking at protein synthesis rates and things. I wonder if if you'd actually be able to pick that up if it was such a thing. You know, you'd say, oh, when they've we've tricked the muscle or something. But it'd be hard to compare because you're doing something different. So you know, how do you compare the two things? Yeah, plus the fact that, that, as I said before, I mean, the adaptability depends on the sets of proteins that are being expressed to a greater extent and also the breakdown that, that facilitates this refurbishment or this, this re, 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 uh, yeah, remodeling of the muscle. And so there's still a lot that we don't know there. All right. Now, we touched on aging a little bit earlier on. And the classic question, I guess, with aging uh, research is how much of what you see is aging per se and how much is the, the you know, the tendency for less being, being less at active? So inactivity versus the aging. Have you looked at, tried to tease that apart at all? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we know that, that uh, muscle is responsive to protein intake and to physical activity. And uh, previously, Mike Rennie uh, um, actually uh, introduced the term anabolic resistance because when he was providing uh, essential amino acids to uh, older people versus younger people, he saw that the capacity to increase muscle protein synthesis was attenuated in the, in the older population. And that was uh, then coined anabolic resistance. Now, uh, it took us about 10 to 15 years to, to uh, basically confirm those data in a more uh, practical uh, uh, setting where we provided uh, protein, 20 grams of protein in young and older people, and we actually saw that the capacity to respond to that 20 grams of protein was greater in the young compared to the old. So base, basal protein synthesis, overnight fasted protein synthesis, was not different. If there was a difference, it was actually higher in the elderly than compared to the young. But the capacity to respond to an anabolic stimulus was less. Now, the big question is, what causes this anabolic resistance? Is it aging per se? Is it any other factor? Now, that is difficult because if you start comparing... Uh, young and older people, it's not only comparing age per se, it's also comorbidities, it's also lifestyle, it's also medication, it's all of these other factors, maybe cardiovascular disease, uh, food intake, 
um, the social uh, social aspects of their life. So you can't compare young and old and only only suggest that it's only aging per se. And as we already discussed, that exercise is the most important factor to drive the sensitivity of muscle to food intake. It makes perfect sense to also suggest that a lack or decline in physical activity reduces the sensitivity of muscle to the anabolic properties of food intake. Now, you can study this easily because you just immobilize uh, young people simply by, for example, leg immobilization or bed rest or even number of steps reduced, uh, daily steps reduced per day. And in all these, these different models, we see a reduced capacity to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, even within the same person. For example, if we immobilize the leg for a week, we see that that leg or that muscle in that leg responds less to the same anabolic stimuli when compared to the other leg. So okay. something in the muscle, even in the, in the, in this exactly same uh, milieu, hormonal milieu, because it's actually receiving the same blood, we actually see uh, a reduced sensitivity to food intake. And so this anabolic resistance is, to the greater extent, defined by reduced physical activity. And of course, we know mm -hmm. that most people um, at 70 or 80 years old um, exercise or have less physical activity than a 20-year-old. So the most, most important factor lies there. Now, the big question is, is there not any age-related muscle loss? Of course, there is, uh, because you, generally nobody, even if they're, they're still actively participating in sports, they simply do not have the same muscle as, as when they were 20 years old to 20 or 40 years old. But there's also plenty of older people um, that are 70 years old and pick up exercise and actually have more muscle than when they're 30. So mm -hmm. the, the point is, there might be some age per se related muscle loss, but it doesn't lead to, in, uh, to uh, for example, reduced health or reduced or impaired functional capacity. In other words, we can still regain a lot of the muscle that we have lost. And to be honest, um, Douglas Penn and Jones, who we unfortunately have lost, um, he actually was one of the first to, um, to define the catabolic crisis model where the age-related muscle loss is to a great, a great uh, extent explained by the muscle loss during short successive periods of immobilization or bed rest, for example, due to elective surgery or COVID or flu or whatever, and that the muscle that is lost during these short five to seven day periods is never fully regained. And then with the next period, you actually get net, mm -hmm. net muscle loss and then net less loss. And, then, and so in the last two decades of your life, you get these short successive periods mm -hmm. where you lose too much muscle, more than you regain. And that causes or that, that actually contributes to most of the muscle loss that we see with aging in a more epidemiological perspective. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. So I just had Sue Bodine on. And so she, she was saying, if anything, the most important time to be to be active and to be exercising is after those periods. And I guess medical professionals wouldn't always think about that. So you're saying you get this reduction in muscle mass, but it's it's not, I mean, we tend to think of it as sort of linear, but you're saying it's more that you have these periods of bed rest, periods of sickness, yep. periods of injury, and it drops and then it doesn't come back again. And if people would actually exercise after that, that would be very important. I mean, our medical ethical committee uh, also, uh, when we do bed rest or immobilization, so leg immobilization in elderly, they basically tell us to, and and and, and we fully agree, that we actually provide them with a revalidation, a rehabilitation program, a strength training program to get them after the study, at least to the level that they were before they were enrolled into the study, because that's your your basically your your ethical, uh, your the best, the good thing to do, the, the better thing to do, and we actually managed to do that. But of course, when you're going to the, to, the, to the hospital and you're older and you break your hip or your knee or you get a new knee or a new hip and you get home, your kids or your grandchildren actually have removed your bedroom downstairs so you don't have to walk up the stairs anymore. So yeah, that means yeah. that you never recruit those type 2 fibers anymore. You don't regain your muscle. And by the next episodes, you're actually losing even more muscle. So it's, wow. it's important that you try to regain all your strength as well as muscle mass after such a short period of uh, reduced physical activity. Exactly. All right. Now with this anabolic resistance, you're saying it's the anabolic stimulus is, is protein, but what about if you, your anabolic stimulus is, is resistance training, for example, so is we there can anabolic rescue, resistance there. So basically mm -hmm. what we show is your, your anabolic resistance, you can fully restore with physical activity. 
So if you, for example, uh, have these elderly people do for the physical activity, or you have very physically active elderly, we don't see the anabolic resistance anymore. Okay, so the anabolic resistance really is is to to food. So as you're aging, if you your anabolic stimulus is resistance training, you, you do not see any anabolic resistance. Yes, that's correct. Okay. If you're physically active, you see you see you basically see you increase the anabolic response to food intake, and then you see a normal response again. And so, and and the the big question is, of course, how much physical activity do you need to normalize your anabolic response to food? And mm. though we tend to, as exercise physiologists, we always believe that it's more exercise, the better. Uh, and it's probably also true. But the minimal amount of exercise that is required to do this might not be that much. Um, we have been using electrical stimulation. And again, I like to warn people by electrical stimulation is not magic. It is not the same stimulus that you have with habitual uh, muscle contraction. So you can better exercise and move yourself. But you can use it as a model to see what happens. And electrical stimulation actually stimulates uh, muscle protein synthesis and can be used uh, effectively in the intensive care unit, even in comatose patients that have massive muscle loss. We actually saw no muscle loss, muscle loss in the vastus lateralis when we actually actually mm -hmm. stimulated muscle in patients who were in a comatose condition. Now, whether you can actually translate to something that is of clinical benefits to these patients is still a long way to go. But it shows that only two small sessions of electrical stimulation where you introduce little muscle contraction to the muscle is already sufficient to have no muscle loss during a full immobilization. I see you. Wow. Okay, that's amazing. Especially because they would have all sorts of hormonal... You know, a lot of stuff goes on when you're in the ICU and often you you don't recover properly just from that experience, but they're actually able to maintain their muscle with electrical stimulation. I mean, we're now very interested in an intensive care unit and also because, um, I mean, um, the discussions about uh, food requirements or nutrient requirements in the ICU uh, were already under discussion when I was a student. And to be honest, if I look back, the discussions haven't really changed much. And so uh, I think the progression has been very little and I would like to just contribute a little bit by by seeing what we can do as exercise physiologists or nutritionists, whatever you want, in in supporting health for uh, intensive care unit patients. And um, yeah, what we've seen with together uh, together with Lee and Chapel in in Adelaide, we actually did a study where we provided intrinsically labeled protein in the ICU to see whether it's actually digestion and absorption that causes the anabolic resistance, which is possible in the ICU as well, of course, or whether it's located in the muscle. And we thought that there was a, an issue with protein uptake and release into the circulation, um, but it wasn't. Actually, all the protein was very well compared to a control group lying also in bed. We actually saw no differences in digestion and absorption. Uh, if there was a difference, actually more of the protein-derived amino acids were released in the circulation in the intensive care unit patients. But the muscle didn't seem to have the capacity to use it to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So there is something inherent in the muscle that is, is, is reducing uh, physical activity. Now, it will be interesting to also see, but it seems that it could be overcome by electrical stimulation. And so the muscle yeah. needs recruitment in order to support exactly. the, the, the turnover. I was thinking before when we were talking about, you know, use it or lose it. You know, if you're a strength trained person, then you stop, then there's no need to maintain the muscle. So if you're yeah. lying in bed, whether it's just voluntarily for a study, study or you're in ICU, there's no real need or, or reason for the muscle to be taking up protein and, and making muscle. And so I think it's not only unlocally in the muscle, it's probably also central. I don't have any, 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 any scientific proof of that, but uh, so the intensive care unit patients that we did here, actually here in Hustle, just across the border, uh, we saw, of course, in the intensive care unit, we can't put them under a DEXA scan or a CT scan or an MRI. So they were lying in the in the in the intensive uh, in the ICU ward, and so we took muscle biopsies, of course, with with uh, consulting their, their their loved ones, and these were in a coma. So we saw in a few days of intensive care unit, like twenty percent or even up to thirty percent change reduction in fiber size. Now we actually see with leg immobilization or bed rest of over a week, you see massive muscle loss on a macroscopic level like muscle cross-sectional area or muscle volume. But typically, because of there's so much variation between muscle fibers, you, you don't find significant declines in muscle fiber size because you have such vari variation in muscle fibers. But in these patients, 
we actually saw on average 20 to 30 percent decline in muscle fiber size imagine that in in a week so mm. the muscle loss is so rapid much more than with disuse or with immobilization so i think especially i mean again no 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 proof of that i think if you also have your central command lost like these people had all neurological issues uh, so so neural trauma on the head um, and so that also when you lose the direct coupling you probably yeah, also have an even more accelerated muscle loss so that's it's like almost also- it's like they're almost innovate uh, de-innovated there's no, it's like there's no nerve stimulus almost as well yeah. wow okay so if we think about the aging uh, people exercising so you're saying the the anabolic resistance to to protein ingestion can be overcome by exercise or physical activity. How much uh, you know, are they able to adapt to resistance training normally, Who? or is it reduced? Who elderly or uh, elderly? So uh, elderly people are able to re- to respond to resistance training. So to, you know, I, I've now I've seen papers years and years ago, ninety year olds doing resistance training and putting on muscle mass when it, they were thinking they shouldn't be able to, the men, because they had no testosterone or lower testosterone, et cetera. So when, when we actually see uh, elderly performing exercise, even when it's only resistance type exercise, we typically also see increases in muscle oxidative capacity and often even an increase in oxygen uptake capacity on a, on a V2 max test. So if you're actually in a lower level of physical conditioning, even resistance training can help you increase endurance capacity. Of course, when you become better well-trained, your training has to be more specific as well. But mm-hmm. we actually see that even with resistance best. training is oxidative capacity. The other thing that you just said is of interest. We just finished uh, or we just published actually a study with uh, prostate cancer patients who we provided with a resistance training protocol um, after they were subjected to uh, androgen deprivation therapy. So most People with prostate cancer get androgen deprivation therapy. So they basically get chemically castrated and they lose a lot of muscle and they gain a lot of fat. And also they have have basically no testosterone. Is that right? Just to clarify. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, we wanted to know whether uh, simple uh, resistance training actually can counteract the negative side effects of the ADT because the ADT is, of course, life saving or life prolonging, I should say. Um, And all the side effects. As far as decline in muscle mass, body composition, uh, muscle strength, we actually saw them, they could gain muscle mass, they could gain muscle strength with simple resistance training. So all those negative side effects of ADT treatment could be completely overcome, even when there's no additional or there's no testosterone. Yeah, so again, this fits with Sue, Sue Bodine and I were talking about muscle atrophy, muscle hypertrophy, you know, whether it's hormonal or signals in the muscle. So this fits again that it seems like it's not really hormonal. It's more the signals in the muscle. Yep. Yep. So I know you had a paper there showing um, 65 to 75-year-olds compared to over 85-year-olds had similar increases in in muscle mass. And I think you did you did talk about uh, improvements in aerobic capacity as well. Um, so basically what's happening there, are they, are, you, are they not showing any sort of resistance you know, they're not showing any detriment so to it's, training, it's not, or is it just? So, so, yeah. this, this, so yeah. this is not a study on protein synthesis. This was just uh, we had the opportunity to work with one of our previous uh, uh, colleagues who was here from Chile, and uh, he wanted to do a study and look at uh, the the capacity to train people. And I said, well, it was an interesting one because more and more we hear that they suggest that when we do an older older subject study. Then uh, we used to call them elderly at 65, but nowadays, of course, the 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 65 is now, or the, the 80 is the new 65, or 65 is the new 80, whatever. Thank goodness, because um, I'm 61, uh, so yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So uh, so we don't call 65 elderly anymore. We call them older population, and we call 80 suddenly elderly. So, and I love again uh, Jack Lalanne, who said, "Old age is everybody 20 years older than I am." So it's a slight it's gliding, sliding scale. Yes. So I think that that is an awesome. I'm using that for myself mm, as well. I like that because mm. when I was when I was 30, I, I would th- I would think everybody 50 years old was old, and now I'm actually thinking like everybody 80 years is exactly. old. So, um, mm-hmm. but what is what is often is that people suggest that at a certain age suddenly you don't respond to exercise anymore, and of course we've shown that protein synthesis can be increased at a very high high age, 
And now this was a nice opportunity to work with people there to show that all the people are still trainable and there are no non-responders to exercise. Mm -hmm. And when people say, yeah, oh, you get those non-responders when you turn 80. No, that's not true. You can still respond at 80. And that's that's the only thing that you have to do in that study. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that the increase in muscle is more or less in that group versus that group because you're talking about different people. And like I said, comparing groups is much more difficult because how are you going to compare absolute relative? How do you compensate or differentiate because of changes in lifestyle, food intake, medication, comorbidities and stuff like that? So the most important message of that paper is at any age, you can adapt. What is more yeah. or less is irrelevant. All right. I know it's irrelevant, but I still can't help thinking it. And I asked Sue, Sue about any of the same, same question. So if you had a... A okay, let's go. Seventy-year-old that had never done any weight resistance training, and you had a thirty-year-old that had never done any resistance training, and they did the same training, right? So the same kilos lifted. Would they get the same response? Do you think? Yeah. So it's 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 funny. Like this, this is this is really a discussion among uh, among scientists because this is the study design that you can never pull off because you can't compare groups that are exactly the same. Um, but if you go back to one of, uh, I'm not sure that the first the, the first author, I forgot his name, but it was somebody from Mike Rennie's group. They also showed anabolic resistance uh, when you performed exercise in young versus old. If you go mm -hmm. back to the paper, you actually see that they had four or five different exercise intensities uh, at the same absolute, the same relative uh, exercise intensities. Okay. Yeah. If you then start comparing you actually saw almost the same protein synthesis at the same absolute intensity. Absolute. Mm -hmm. So if you train everybody at the same relative intensity, of course, the workload of an elderly person is less. Be less. So it mm -hmm. makes sense that they respond less. So I think if yes. you're going to start comparing two different groups, young and old, you have to compare them both at the same absolute and the same relative intensity. Yes. And generally, that's impossible because you can't have an older person perform it's exercise at exactly at 50 or 75 percent of the young well-trained people so that makes these different these studies almost impossible to perform that's interesting though so if you did if you did a 30 year old you know doing weight training that it wasn't that hard for them and then the the 70 year old doing it hard for them but the same absolute workload it's it, based yep. on the protein synthesis it sounds like it's about the same yep. but who knows you know what what would happen in terms of strength and and, and hypertrophy down the track and so the only thing that we know so much or so little, but so much compared to other uh, tissues is on muscle because we can repeatedly take muscle biopsies. Uh, what it does on tendons, uh, cartilage, mm -hmm. bone, heart, liver, pancreas, lung, uh, brain, I mean, all of this stuff, at least on protein synthesis, we don't know because, but all of the adaptability is of course not muscle. I mean, we also, uh, the muscle can only perform its activities because of perfusion. Uh, because of the heart pumping the blood, the lungs actually uh, providing the, the oxygen. So all of these factors are all into play. They all have to work together as one in order to, to improve uh, endurance or resistance training or adaptability. Can I just clarify something? So when you're talking about protein synthesis rates that you're measuring, sometimes you're looking at whole body, but other times you're actually looking at the muscle itself, right? You're doing, doing biopsies. So can we just clarify, when we've been talking about protein synthesis rates, in elderly and you know effective endurance and strength and whatever are you talking about muscle or are you talking about whole body in most of the cases i if i talk about muscle um, protein synthesis i typically refer to studies where we me measure muscle protein synthesis because okay. i mean sometimes we're being asked by reviewers to also um, show whole body protein synthesis but it's not until recently that i understand that whole body protein synthesis um what that actually means. And now that I know the turnover of all these other other, other organs and tissues, uh, the mix of what represents whole body protein synthesis is quite different than what is actually in our mm. textbooks. Because in the past, mm -hmm. people said like, like, like whole body uh, protein uh, synthesis uh, more or less reflects muscle because it's such a big mm -hmm. organ, like it's 30 mm -hmm. kilos in, in the whole body. But if you look at the turnover rates of all these organs that are 20 to 30 fold higher than the muscle, then the muscle doesn't doesn't really contribute that much to whole body protein metabolism. So exactly, just, so whole body doesn't earlier. tell me a whole lot. Exactly, which is what you said earlier. So thankfully, when we've been talking about protein synthesis, 
with exercise, you're generally talking about muscle, which is what we need to know. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Now, another thing out of interest is um, effective exercise on protein use during exercise. So, you know, we generally say very little protein is used. Um, you know, the textbooks will say five to 10%, but that the 10% is more likely if you've been fasting and it's very, very long exercise. And I actually had someone on social media saying, they were talking about how part of the reason you need to have a lot of protein is because you're using it during exercise. And I said, well, that's, you're not using a whole lot during exercise. So I wonder if you can just talk to us about that. So if it's only 10% of energy uh, provision during exercise, you can easily calculate uh, how much protein that is. Uh, and so unless you're spending like eight hours on the bike or whatever, uh, it's not a whole lot in absolute amounts. And in the light of the total protein intake in an endurance athlete, which is tremendously high, especially if you express it compared to the number of kilos or, uh, or, or fat-free mass that that person has, then it's not that much, um, especially not considering the total energy intake that these guys have or girls have, um, because they still consume 10 to 15 energy percent protein. So in total amounts, it's a huge amount of protein. Now, of course, it becomes a little bit different when you start doing a lot of endurance type exercise in an energy restricted diet or a low protein intake diet. I mean, then it might actually uh, become uh, really uh, a significant part, but that is spe very specific situations. So so the 10% is the higher end anyway, isn't it? Isn't it that yeah, what you're yeah, actually I mean, using that, 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 exercise that's is ready. 2 or 3%? If at all it is 10%, then it still wouldn't mm. be a lot on the total amount because it's like 10% on energy expenditure during like say two hours of endurance exercise now express that towards the total daily protein intake it's not that much now we were talking off air about um, what happens to protein synthesis during exercise so you tend to think you know be turned off because that's there's no use you know using but why don't you tell us what happens to protein synthesis during exercise and what happens if you're ingesting protein during exercise. Yeah, so some some a lot of the older studies then then we assume that especially when when you actually perform signaling, so molecular um, molecular signaling in the muscle as a sort of representation of what muscle metabolism is really doing, which I think in general cases you 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 actually don't get a good picture of it because there are only snapshots in time. Um, but um, so some people suggest you either have anabolism or catabolism, and it's 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 an on and off. It's a, it's it's a green or a red. Uh, but it's not. I mean, you have some proteins that are being synthesized to a great extent during exercise, and some will be less synthesized during, 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 during exercise. In our experience, so with all the proteins in the muscle, so we measure mixed muscle protein synthesis rates or micellar, micellar protein synthesis rates, it actually increased during endurance type exercise, even without protein intake. And I think that is simply because of increased perfusion of the muscle, which actually provides more amino acids to the muscle, thereby also stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Of course, it's not the same level that you have after exercise and certainly not after exercise with additional protein intake. But mm -hmm. actually, during exercise, it's not like you completely block protein synthesis. It's, uh, metabolism is not that simple. It's much more complex. So you, you, you've got some protein synthesis going on during exercise. Do you have protein breakdown? I'm assuming you have protein breakdown during exercise, or is that more during recovery? Yes, I, and I assume it's a little bit higher as well. Um, of course, um, I mean, um, we, don't, we know a lot less about protein breakdown than we know about mm. protein synthesis. Uh, but, I mean, the fact that you're, you're staying in balance and the plasticity is still there means that if you're in a balance, I mean, the protein breakdown should be the same as the protein synthesis. Now, you mentioned earlier, just in passing, I think you said the nitrogen balance is not very accurate or not very helpful. What were you saying there? So you, you can't really use that? Or? So basically what you're doing with nitrogen balance is you measure the amount of nitrogen that is excreted uh, in the urine, and then you you basically forget about nitrogen in other, other ways that you're losing it. Um, so the nitrogen yeah. loss is basically uh, based on the, and then you actually set that off towards the nitrogen intake. But of course, we all know how difficult it is to um, uh, to actually um, measure pr protein in or daily food intake because self-reported mm -hmm. intake is always an, an, an underestimation, of course. So the mm -hmm. only way of really doing this is in the respiration chamber, for example, uh, fully standardized conditions, uh, which of course is not a free living condition. So a lot of the uh, the, the 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 nitrogen balance studies are, are flawed. Uh, so. 
That's true, because if anyone's uh, exercised and then put their, their clothes in a bag and then forgotten for a few days, you'd smell a lot of ammonia there. So that's nitrogen that you're losing through sweat. And you, and you have to do it over a, very, a very lot of different days because, I mean, what you lose today is not what you ate, ate yesterday and the other way around. So, I mean, so uh, mm. th those are much more complex than people think. And a, a lot of the, the, the guidelines are based on old nitrogen balance studies that are simply not, uh, yeah, I don't think that they give us a good insight. Okay, great. Now, just thinking again about protein intake. So if you're injured or if you're like in the ICU or whatever, does prote increasing protein, does that help with protein synthesis um, per se, or do you need to do the exercise? Well, I guess you've already said that. So when you take protein, so if someone's injured, for example, and they're, they're losing their muscle mass, they're getting at atrophy, does increasing the protein in the diet help to reduce that atrophy? Good, good question. We actually did this uh, and we looked at whether increasing protein intake above normal levels would uh, maintain or preserve muscle mass during immobilization. It didn't. However, okay. what we do know from the literature is that you actually lose more muscle when you reduce protein intake. So in a lot of the clinical mm -hmm. work that we do, we advocate a more protein dense diet. And then this is also something that is always mis misconceived is that people suggest that I'm suggesting protein supplementation or ingesting a lot of protein in, in more clinically conditions. No, I'm suggesting at least maintain the same absolute amount of protein. But if you actually want to maintain the same absolute amount, uh, amount of protein consumed at a lower energy intake because you're lying in bed all day and you may uh -huh. be in pain and stuff like that, you actually 100%. have to eat a more protein dense diet which can be done by fortification of your, of your food with, with protein powders. It could be by using supplements or clinical nutrition uh, products or simply by eating more uh, protein-rich products exactly. like dairy okay. meat or uh, okay. vegetable proteins, whatever. So, mm -hmm. so the most important thing is that when you become uh, admitted to the hospital, try at least to maintain the same amount of protein you were consuming mm -hmm. before you went to the hospital where your body yep. is adapted to. Because if you eat less, you will expedite muscle loss. Okay, perfect. Now, there's a lot of hype about collagen and, and supplementation. And and just last week, I had Michael Kerr on. We just just released that one. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned tendons before. And he was sort of having a bit of a laugh that, you know, people think, oh, my, my tendon has got a lot of collagen in it. So therefore, I need to eat collagen. But as he said, it gets broken down to the amino acids, gets absorbed, doesn't mean it's okay. going to be end up as collagen. But I, I see you have done some studies, collagen protein ingestion during recovery for exercise does not increase muscle connective protein. But so we, have, since, we, since have, this, mm -hmm. we have a whole range of studies that have been published and a lot more will, probably will be coming out because we actually follow that that trail. And I would have loved to, I mean, I have to listen back to Michael's uh, Michael's podcast. And I think he's completely right in what he's saying because the story behind it is a little bit strange. I mean, yes, collagen is a very good source of glycine and proline. From a quality perspective, collagen is not a good protein, very low quality. Um, so does the body have enough glycine and proline to support maximal stimulation of uh, adaptability on uh, cartilage, bone, uh, tendons, uh, uh, joints, everything? Now, that is a question that is not fully uh, if elucidated yet. But of course, the idea itself is a little bit simplistic. It's not that much different from the Romans saying you eat the lion's heart and you get the bravery of a lion. Exactly. I mean, it's, 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 it's not, I mean, people think that that was ridiculous, but it's the same ridiculous saying like, hey, I eat collagen uh, because that it's good for my collagen. Um, <laughs> it's a good source of glycine and proline, but um, do, we need, uh, do we need extra or do we have enough in our diet? And now there's some people that suggest that there's not enough glycine and proline in our diet because we're not, we're having these pro, uh, processed foods. We're not having boil anymore and stuff like stuff like 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 this. Or when we don't consume meat or skins, uh, stuff like that. But for, there's there's no proof of that. And so we have a lot of studies where we're looking at um, the impact of collagen supplementation or collagen ingestion on the stimulation of the connective uh, proteins in muscle. And so far, we have not uh, we've shown that exercise actually promotes adaptation to connective tissue in muscle, which helps you to generate force, of course. Um, but so far, we haven't found really a surplus benefit of nutrition on that process. Now, whether that's because we're not using the right protein, 
not the right amount or not the right timing is all uh, unclear. And so that is something that we're still investigating. And otherwise, also, how does nutrition impact the adaptability of other tissues that contain more collagen than muscle, such as ligaments, tendons, uh, cartilage, bone? So there's still a lot of stuff to do there. But I, okay. uh, so far, we, we've not been able to confirm all the speculations that are living in the, uh, in the popular media that ingesting collagen improves everything. But of course, we have somebody like Keith Barr now with his sabbatical here in our lab. And he actually believes a lot in the collagen and the proposed benefits on uh, on tendons and, and ligaments. And so now we're actually trying to combine more in vitro work with the in vivo human work to see how we can figure out to what extent we can use collagen to uh, to improve adaptability of, of uh, non, uh, non-muscle uh, tissues. All right, great. So we'll start to sort of finish up. I've got a couple of general questions here. Uh, Bas Van Huren, Huren, I think you know him. He's a researcher. What studies would you do if there's money was no issue? So if you were just bathed in money, you had a, a wealthy billionaire. Yeah, so then there would be about a, a thousand different studies that I could mention because anything that we've done on the muscle, we haven't done on other tissues to the adaptability and, and plasticity of other tissues which is from a logistic point of view, very difficult studies to perform. Um, of course, uh, more long-term effects of uh, protein quality, protein amount, protein distribution. How does one meal affect the other meal? How does exercise come into play in that process? I mean, there's, there's so many things that we can address. It's it's amazing. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, Alex has asked a question. If, if you had one exercise program to give to people to help them begin, so starting out to get fit and healthy, what would you give them? So type of exercise, volume, frequency, and so on. Yeah, I mean, that's that's always a combination of resistance and endurance type exercise activities. It should be personalized, meaning uh, it should be uh, adapted to the targets that the, the subject or the volunteer or the patient sets. For example, if somebody's obese, then probably the first, first uh, target is to lose weight. If somebody is frail and not able to live independently, we would probably focus more on strength. So, so set the targets and personalize the intervention. And yeah, I mean, those are the main, uh, main important things. And of course, anything else in between or in, uh, in sur- surplus is, for example, a nutritional intervention that benefits the adaptive response to the exercise. But priority number one is the exercise. Exactly. All right. Uh, someone also asked, asked about um, differences between males and females. I guess we haven't talked about that really. Yeah, I think that's a good, I mean, we already also have these discussions here. Um, a lot of people now want us to include both women and men in the same study, which certainly with nutrition is difficult because, for example, how much of a certain protein or a certain supplement or a certain food do you give because there's differences in body composition? So I fully agree that we should do more studies in women, but I think we should do at least the same amount of studies in women as in men but not necessarily combining them in in one and the same study because that actually increases uh, inter-subject variation. And so that is not probably not from a a study design perspective, not the smartest thing to do. Mm -hmm. So far, we have not shown huge differences when we look at uh, studies in men and women. Um, For as as far as, uh, I mean, I always make fun of this, but as far as protein goes, the women seem to be uh, responding more rapidly and more strongly to the same amount of protein. And no. so, but in fact, that was when we provided the same amount of protein the same to amount. the women as the mm. men. Small. And so per kilogram of body mass or per kilogram mm-hmm. fat-free mass, it was more. So maybe that is at least part of the greater and more rapid response in the women. So when you start comparing men and women, I mean, there's so many different things that are also into play. Mm. So I think we should basically... If we want to do a dose response effect, we do it in women and in men. If we want to see an impact on, on, on muscle volume and muscle protein synthesis, do it in both in women and in men. So I guess you'd you'd need to do it per kilogram or even per kilogram of lean. Yes, and but I mean do tricky. Do it per, per kilogram of muscle mass, body mass. Um, but you can also say per kilogram or per per, per, per surface of the of the intestine. I mean, there's so yeah. many things that you can yeah, actually yeah. 
you can't standardize, okay. but it's, that's possible. I think we just have to do more studies in both men as well as in women. Mm -hmm. But All in right, general, well, thank you. We, we find the same the same responses. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. What I'd like to do at the end is just to uh, finish up with some takeaway messages from our chat. I think um, protein intake and physical activity are the most important factors uh, stimulating muscle protein synthesis and are therefore instrumental in muscle maintenance. If you lose the fact of physical activity or reduce the fact of physical activity, you become less sensitive to the impact of nutrition on, uh, on muscle protein synthesis. And the opposite is also true. When you become inactive, you're less sensitive. So uh, basically, it's very dangerous in a clinical situation where you reduce the level of physical activity because you generally also reduce food intake. So especially in clinical care, we should focus on sufficient physical activity and food intake to maximize recovery. And of course, we already know this in, 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 in sports nutrition and in coaches and athletes know this, but we hardly use it in clinical care because being sick is like playing professional sports. And that is something that we need to apply more often. You know what, I can't help myself, but on Twitter, there's been the last few days going around this sort of argument, oh, what's the most important, you know, diet, seeing as you talk about food and exercise together, people are trying to say, you know, this black and white sort of polarized sort of discussions, like what's the most important thing, your diet or your exercise? And some people are saying, well, if, you know, you can exercise all you want, but if you've got a bad diet, forget it, you're going to get heart disease and whatever. Other people are saying, Really, exercise will, will will sort of overtake any sort of you know you can run outrun a, a bad diet type of thing. Do you have any thoughts on this? Although we probably should be playing into these. Uh... I mean, I work a lot also in clinical care, and that there we actually think of I think personally that increasing physical activity is the more beneficial one because if you start taking on more physical activity, you start eating more, and that also means that you actually uh, relieve any nutritional deficiencies. So. Um, it's like what I said before on Jack LaLanne is if, if exercise is king and nutrition is queen, then together you have a kingdom. There you go. Well, you're not really on Twitter. It sounds like you, you should get in there and weigh in. But you, you could. I didn't used to do Twitter really before I started this. But uh, Probably stay away from it. Now, I like saying at the think, start, you've got the diet leave, on one side. I think I leave it to other people. Exactly. I, I like how you've got the diet on one side and the exercise on the other. So you've got your apple over there. And you've got your bikes. And you've got two bikes. Okay, so bike exercise is more important. There you go. Definitely. Okay, thanks again for your time, mate. Good on you. You're welcome. Thanks, Glenn. See ya. See okay. you soon. Bye-bye. See you. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.